can recognize the format, the, uh, the structure of the dream, yeah, will point to the unstructuredness of the dreamer. And then, after, when you see the unstructuredness of the dreamer, or sense that, you'll see the unstructuredness in the dream. Yeah? There won't be two anymore. There won't be the dreamer and the dream. You'll just see it's all just one cloth in a way. Yeah? That, that's how it helped me. When I started, when, like, when the frame of duality was put on how I perceive things, you know, how the perceiving was going on, I saw either or, yes or no, this or that, and then it wasn't a real perceiving, it's structured, it's formatted, it's a program. Yeah. Yeah? So, how can nothing appear to be something, it has to be formatted. Yeah? Sort of like to download a file into a system, it has to be formatted to fit the system. Well, there isn't any system. That's what's been formatted, yeah? The appearance of a system is the format. Yes? And so the appearance in the system, let's say it's dualistically, and primarily it comes to a point of the dualism of subject-object. Yeah? Well, like in Zen, in the, the great treatise of reliance on mind, you know, faith mind, supposedly purported to be written by the fifth patriarch of Zen. I, you know, they have no idea, really. But in that, it says, <coughs> there is no subject without an object, and there's no object without a subject. Yeah? So there is no subject without an object. <coughs> and there is no object without a subject. Yeah? So the wholeness of the fabric is, all there is is awareness, let's say, and how it gets formatted is into subject-object. Yes? So, when the seeing is sensed by this apparatus, yeah? The seeing, which is the whole fabric, just seeing, the sense of it is, when it recognizes that seeing, it implies to it, the format, a seer. So now, the seer, which is in a sense true, because the seeing is the seer, but not as it's interpreted by the mind. The mind interprets it as I'm the seer, which is this, yeah? Or the, the individual spirit soul of, that's in this, yes? That I'm the seer, which doesn't equate to me to be everyone else, it's I am the seer, yes? And therefore, and then everything that's seen is the object to me as the subject. This is the definite essence of delusion here. Yeah. So the whole fabric gets cut, in a sense, and it becomes subject-object. Yeah. And you, so what's conceiving this place, yes, is sense, yeah? the conceiving of this place is sense, but what it's sensed as is a conceiver. Yeah. So you, or me, or God, becomes the conceiver of this place. The, the mind can't just see, everything is just seen. It has to believe there's a seer somewhere in it, yeah? And if it can't see it as you, it'll say it's God or whatever, you know, the all eternal one being, this and that. But there's got to be a seer. It's so, the whole, the whole streaming of functioning here gets separated by mind, interpreted into subject-object. As soon as that, as soon as the one, is, there's not a one, there can only be a sense of one with a two, yeah? Well, let's just say, the one gets partitioned or interpreted into the two-ness, it geometrically progresses the two-ness into to four, then to eight, then to six, and then, like in, in Chinese philosophy, they say the 10,000 things are born, yes? As soon as... All there is to seeing becomes subject object, then there's thousands of things occur. Yeah? Ten thousand things would signify this whole place. Yeah? So now there's and yet, no matter how many things you meet, you are always taken to be the subject. Yeah? You're taken to be the subject, and everything else becomes an object to you. 
we're just going to this questioning, are you that subject? Because you are that subject, but not as the mind is interpreting it. Yes? You are the subject. There's only, all there is is subjectivity. All there is is seeing without an object to be seen. Yeah? The appearance of an object creates the seer and seeing. Yeah? But in fact, all there is is seeing. All there is is awareness. Yeah? There's not an awareness of anything. There's just awareness as. Yeah? But the head, the reaction of the conditioned mind is, it immediately, and you see it every time there's a verb in your life, there's definitely a noun that did it. That's what happens. So if something happens to you, <laughs> you believe someone did it to you, in a sense, or something did it to you. So when you see life is happening to you, as the subject, yes, it's a very small, small, small interpretation. Yeah? And so then all the objects that you're dreaming, in a sense, that, and it's not you dreaming, we're saddled with this language, all the objects that are being dreamt now have the power, the power to affect you as the subject to them. Yeah? And so without a subject, there is no object, and without an object, there is no subject. That's the freedom. Yeah? Is when, so, in a sense, let's just get down to the raw data, the seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, yes? Your whole life is comprised based on that in raw data. Seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, yes? There'd be no memory unless there was some seeing somewhere along the way. Yeah? And then that memory, has, that seeing has been encased into a conceptual box and now is what's interpreting your life today. Yeah? So here's the seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching. All day, every day. As long as you're awake or conscious, that's what's happening. Yeah? You can see the movement of that mind we just, we just spoke about. There's the claiming of the seeing. The seeing is not sense as seeing, it implies a seer to the head, doesn't it? Every time there's seeing, every time there's hearing, every time there's feeling, every time there's tasting and touching, it implies a seer, a hearer, a feeler, a taster, and toucher, yes? Now that's pretty cool in a way, because the seer here, there is a seer here, a feeler, but it's not what you think. It's not you as an individual, long-lasting, separate entity. It's the eye of all eyes. Yeah? The eye, which is appearing as all these different yous, but all it is is I. There's only, everyone states the truth every day. I'm seeing, I'm hearing, I'm feeling, I'm tasting, I'm touching. That is the God honest truth. But the, what the eye implies to the mind is not the I I, or the eye of subjectivity, it's the I as a you, which we call me. Yeah? It's the identification of the seeing and the claiming it and then putting this to be the doer of that seeing is the delusion. And it just progresses geometrically. If it goes on unattended, it just... And it seems as real as real can be to who? You! The sense of a you is totally necessary for this place to feel real to. It has to have a you to feel real. Yeah? Just like the you needs this place to appear real, and the real, this place to be real has to be, have a you to see it. Yeah? It's one thing. It's not two different things happening. This is real and it's a fake. No. It's the whole thing is one piece of cloth. It's only the mind that separated it. Yes? The mind partitioned life. The streaming of life has been partitioned and so the verb of lifing is now, the story about it is written as a noun and a verb. That's all it is. It just slipped nouns in there. <laughs> and from the noun point of view, it looks like something's happening to you. <laughs> Obviously. And it's very difficult as a you to get out of that view. I mean, people that go to therapy and study in philosophies trying to get relief from that point of view of looking at life as if it's happening to you. But they're doing it as a you. Yeah? So no matter what they do, no matter how they try to change that view, as a you, it's going to persistently stay in the same direction. Life is going to be felt as happening to you. Yeah? And it's going to have a feeling. 
It's going to produce feelings and reactions, and it's going to, it's a very, very enticing, believable thing. Yeah? What's beautiful is, is not, on any given day, we're not all crazy at the same time. So if you actually share in a community and you can talk to someone about what seems so real to you, they may be going, Jesus Christ, there's no shred of reality of, of, at all to, about that to me. And maybe then you could question, well, then how real is it? If it's, if it's not real to everyone, how real could it be? Yeah? If I could be here immersed in total, total pain and someone's in the same location a foot away from me and they're not in any pain then what the hell is going on here? Is this a real place? Because if this was real, then it's, it's giving of an experience would be the same experience to everybody. Yeah. If this was real, everyone would have the same experience of it. It's not real. Because we've given it the meaning it has. Subjective, su the pure subjectivity has been, com has been subjectified. We're subjectifying it. Yeah? Pure subjectivity, we take it to be subjective. Yeah? It's me. It's about me. It's me. So we are, this apparatus, from that point of view, give everything all the meaning it has because inherently, like in Buddhism, this is inherently empty. Of what? Empty of an inherent meaning. It's not real in and of itself. That's why they talk about it in Buddhism. They call Everything is empty. There's em the emptiness of this place. The emptiness means whatever is seen, felt, taste, touch, and whatever is seen, you know, feeling, tasting, touch, is inherently empty of, an, of a singular existence. It's not real in that inherent sense. Its qualities are actually contrived and given to it. Yes? by the subject of the experience. Yeah? In, the, in the interpretation, it looks like this is doing it to me. Yes? This has these qualities. But then you would say, okay, if this can do it to me, it should be able to do it to James and Z and Z. Exactly on the same level. Because this has an inherent power, and if it meets you, that inherent power is going to tattoo you to a certain depth of your skin, and everyone who comes in contact with it will feel the realness of this. But it doesn't, does it? The meaning has been given to it. The impact it has, even though there's, let's say, a meager amount of impact that's inherently given by the dream, the collectiveness of it, but the subjectiveness of the experience will be very different. Yeah? That's, for me, that would cue you into something. You know? Like, something would be cued in. Jesus, I meet something one day, it's a drag, the next day it isn't, and then the next day it's a drag. What the fuck's going on here? Really? Is this a real, solid, inherently existing place? Or, do I have a much larger role in it than I thought? Even though I think I'm the center of the universe in a mental way, called self-centeredness, in a sense, that's missing the whole point. Because I am the center of the universe. But not in the mental way of taking it. I truly am the center of the universe. All meaning of this life is coming as this, through this. So once you start seeing a little bit of the fabric of how it's formulated, it starts... It starts you pull one thread, it starts unwinding. And then once it gives a sense of, once you see, see like for me, when I was young, life just overwhelmed me, yeah? It seemed like feelings, like when people died in my life who were rather important to me, I had never had the experience of someone dying who I loved, and I had no idea, no concepts yet had felt formed about all that. And it was quite a rush when it happened to me. I didn't, know, my little apparatus got overwhelmed. Just shut down and just went way, way in, you know. But I went into the ass of self, basically, into the, the mind. And my whole life at that point was, I'm going to make these things unreal. I can't handle them, handle them. They're too real to me. Loving someone and having them die, and I just can't handle them. It's way overboard. So my whole pursuit then, my mind strategy being... 
my managerial team up there, was let's avoid feelings like this at all costs. Anything else is, is, is easy to pay for, but don't have these feelings anymore. So I started making things unreal as much as I could. Reading science fiction and horror, and I found alcohol and drugs, and I found spirituality also, but they were all really meant to make things unreal. Yeah? Because I couldn't bear the reality of this place. Then, after all those things were exhausted, none of them actually succeeded. Yeah? I would put off something, but it always catch up to me. And really, really, like an intense avalanche of stuff would occur. I finally decided, somehow, something shifted, and I'd wanted, I let it be as real as it wanted to be. Everything that's happening here. As real as it wanted to be. And when I did that, what it did, it has started to reveal its unreality to me. It was so fucking cool. All the while I was trying to make it unreal, I was giving it a reality. I was giving it a reality. I had no idea this is giving everything the meaning it has. So my wanting to run away from it made it real enough to want to run away from it. Yeah? As soon as I let it be as real as it wanted to be, what happened? It started to reveal itself as unreal. Yeah? And then the, the need to transcend was dismissed. Because the transcending was just to try to get an advantage as this, here. <laughs> I thought I, as this, would be enlightened. Yes? I, after all these hours of meditation, would rise above and have the best strategy of all. I'd be detached from life and just sort of hover above it. Be separate from it. Be better than. Yes? It's insanity. Man, when that collapsed... The need to be liberated was lifted. Yeah, I didn't want to get out of here anymore. And when, why? Because there's no place to get out of. This would have to be real to get out of. You can't get out of something that's not real. It's impossible. Your attempts to get out of something that's not real is what gives it the meaning of being real. You can't escape it. It's like a trick. If you try to get out of it, you're in it. Yeah. No matter how slick the trying to get out of it is, you can act like I'm not the doer of trying to get out of it. It's all baloney. You're all, it's all stuck. You're still stuck. Yes? And you know it. There's a sense. You know? <laughs> but if you let it be as real as it real can be, there's a flavor of unreality here. Yeah? That I hope will wash over you. Washed over whatever you want to call this. And it drenched me. And over the time, it just revealed a new way of looking. Yeah. I found out a new freedom isn't something that's attained by Paul. A new freedom is a way of living as Paul, let's say. Which isn't based on knowing, it's based on finding out. I have all the information I need. I reached that point a while ago. I do not need any more information. No. I get a lot of downloads, but there's no need for information at all. The only per point that it has is to share, basically. That's the only point it has. There's no need for knowing. There's just finding out. Yes? There's no need to escape, because there's nothing to escape from. Just knowing that, yeah, things are as real as they appear to be. It's not a formula of making it unreal. You see? This message is not a formula that makes something that you really believe is real to be less real. It doesn't work. It really doesn't hold water. This message is just hoping to tickle the mind so that the form it's taken to be in, it's like um, posture, it's like it's skeletal chassis, all the conceptual and ideas and old ideas and beliefs, it's almost like a chiropractic retreat can open up, and then by its opening up, you find out. Yeah. You find out what mind is really like. It's not like what we've taken to be. The true essence of mind is to reflect. That's what it can. So it can reflect the awareness, not and not make it into noun and verb, but just reflect the awareness. So you, you, here, can be conscious of awareness. Yeah? Right now, we're conscious of awareness that's been diced up and cut up by the mind's process, interpretation. We see everything as 
someone doing it, someone having it, yes? Someone who's the seer, someone who's the hearer, someone who's the feeler, someone who's the taster, someone who's the toucher. And yet that is totally, totally, totally after the point of conscious contact. It's the mind's interpretation of what's going on. You are an afterthought, really, to life. Life is every, whatever you want, you want to call it a moment. I don't think there's any moment with another or another. But let's just say that. You are an afterthought to life. Life is conscious contact. And then the mind's reaction to that is you're the one that's seemingly in conscious contact. But you can't even, doesn't it seem like you're quite unconscious? Especially to that. Doesn't it seem like you're unconscious to the fact of seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, and you're very aware of the subject-object interpretation? You're very aware of who's seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching. There's tons of opinions about what you saw. Yes, you may resent the object, you may love that object, but the seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching has been really, I would say, underappreciated. You don't sense it whatsoever, yeah? You're living an interpretation. You're up against the wall of James every way to turn. It's like that box. You know, they used to have that three-sided box. It tells you the story of life. You're in self-centeredness. And so you're looking down this thing, and you see the two walls and the other wall. So you assume that you're in a box, yeah? But you don't realize that this identification plays the fourth wall. You as this is the living fourth wall. If this was seen not to be a long-lasting, independent, separate entity, or was just entertained, you would realize you'd look right through this and you'd see the opening from that place you want to so much escape from, that it was never a confined space. It was never four walls. Never. There's constantly an opening. Yeah? But we take ourselves to be the fourth wall. This is it. And from this point of view, when you only see these three walls, it can seem to be that you're imprisoned. Somehow you've fallen into a prison that someone must have done something, or you must have done something to be here. Because you can't just let a verb be a verb. It has to be a noun involved. You just can't let life happen. It always has to be a to a you or to a me or something. Yes, it's just inevitable. It always gets written into the story. Every It's like... Every day, verbing, just verbing after verbing pages. And we just, the mind, every second after the verb, puts a noun in there. <laughs> it just writes up the story. We don't even see, it's not even close to the, the, the color of the original ink. You know what I mean? We miss the whole thing. We use a red little pen. Jack, you did this to Paul, did that. I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> then you look at the story of life and it's fucking confusing, isn't it? You bring it to a therapist, and they fucking sit with you and go over it. Let's go over the chapters of your life. Give me a break. Jesus Christ. Every chapter you look into forms another chapter. You don't understand. History is made now in the mind. It's no real history. It's made now. The feeling of a historical figure is an illusion. So when you bite the bait of mind and become the fish, you immediately feel like you've been a fish for quite a while. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've had it. I've sensed it. I've watched it. <laughs> you're, all, you're all just freed, whatever, just trucking around. Suddenly, the, the, the little bait of claiming the freedom. Oh, I'm, I'm free. Yeah? You get a sense of it's you that's free. Not others, but you as a special entity. <laughs> And that is like when that free-flowing awareness, whatever, takes the form of a fish. Yeah? As soon as it bites it and takes it to claim it, oh, I'm feeling great today. I'm free. I'm not you, but I'm free. Yeah? Then, and then the feeling, as soon as the bait's taken, is that you're a historical fish, that there's been a pall all this long time, ever since I was in New York, and therefore, and then the future appears to be real. And there'll be a Paul later. I've got to be concerned about what's going to happen to Paul. Because Paul is going, I can see him riding into the distance for many, many years. I have to be concerned of that. 
there's a lot of pitfalls I may run into in those days. Yeah? So let me take this lovely moment to be worried about that mythical moment. You've got to be prepared. Has any of your preparations actually worked? <laughs> <laughs> what was that guy? What was that guy? Howard Hughes. He used to walk with Kleenex boxes. And I think he still died of the common cold or something. Who knows? He was like, "I'm going to stop." And then, so you feel nothing's going to take me from the outside. Something just moves in the inside. <laughs> it's hilarious. And then why? Why does it have so much meaning that everything will be okay later if right now it's not okay? You know? Have you ever seen people when they're buying their third house? And I would think the whole idea of having a house would be for security or happiness, yes? But the whole process is very unhappy and very stress producing. So really, the goal is about being happy in the future, but that goal, the the obsessing over that goal actually produces what? The exact opposite effects that thing represents. Oh, when I get there, everything will be great. But the getting there sucks. You know? Isn't that insane? It always used to flip me out. I'd listen to people and go, Jesus Christ. I can understand that you have this concept that's going to make everything great later, but what about now you're totally flipped out? And in Marin, it's like their third house, you know, their fourth house. It gets a little abusive there, too. Well. They're concerned about their fourth house. So you give me a break. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but you see it. The head is unbelievable. Watch it. Tell the truth about it. Tell the truth about what, what you see. Yeah. Like Huang Po said, whatever can be seen, can't see. Whatever can be perceived, can't perceive. Yeah. So I can perceive a body just like I can perceive this body. This is not what's perceiving. Yeah. I can look in a mirror and look at the eye and see the eye, but that's not what's seen. I can look into the ear and see where a hearing is occurring, but that's not what's hearing. Yeah. You can't see subjectivity. It's not an object. Obviously. Subjectivity can't be an object. It's no thingness. Yeah? For something to be known, to be known, has to be an object. You have to be able to touch it, feel it, taste it, think about it. But this you can't capture. You can't capture subjectivity. It's no thingness. It has no qualities that you can actually know. All there is, is the intimation of it, because it's all there is. I mean, I'm sure a fish, every once in a while, dawns that it's dawns to itself that it's in water. It probably has an incredible epiphany while it's swimming one day, running away from the bigger fish, and it realizes water, yeah? It couldn't see it, really. It can't feel it because it's never not felt it, yeah? It can't taste it or touch it because it's all there is, but maybe one day when it's swimming, it just hits them, water, yes, that's what it's like. Water. And maybe all it takes is that one time and it's never unconvinced. It may be unconvinced up here, but that does, this can never be convinced. But the unspoken yes has happened. There's been a recognition and it's really a done deal. Yeah? Because the fish woke up. It sensed the water. Like we were in, uh, down in India and we went into this pharmacy. CBS, whatever. And everyone's doing their thing, and I notice there's this hummingbirds flying around in this big farm. I mean, those pharmacies are huge. So, like, everything looks like Costco now. You know, they're huge buildings. <laughs> like 800, you know, baby powders. <laughs> All made by the same company with different names. It's insane. Then a block away, they have the same thing. Every town down there had the same setup. There was Walgreens, CVS. I mean, in like, like a five-minute distance. I mean, how, how many Walgreens do you need? But whatever. So here's this hummingbird flying really fast. And the whole place upside is windows, yeah? And yet, but the hummingbird, thank God, he probably hit into it a few times, but he wasn't trying to go through them anymore. But in his system of thought, he couldn't get. We had, we, they had a big open uh, door that could open and close. So I asked the guy, let's keep this open, and hopefully the hummingbird will fly out. So it was a rather big invitation. 
and I stood away so he wouldn't get scared, but he wasn't getting it. The format of a hummingbird was excluding its vision from that door. So he was destined to keep looking, seeking a way out. The way out was available at all times, right where it was, but he couldn't recognize it. And you could try to go, you know, or whatever, but it was just incessantly flying, but it just couldn't get his, that formatted head. Couldn't get that. That's a door. Well, maybe he got out, but we were there for a while and he didn't get out. That's sort of what it's like in self-centeredness. We're in this system of self-centeredness. The escape, if you want to call it that, is always available at all times, but the way we're looking, right, is how seeing is forbidden to us in a way. We're busy looking for it, and we don't realize the looking for it is the blindness to it. And no matter how you look, no matter how tricky you get, no matter how subtle, no matter how many practices you've done, if the sense of being a subject, yes, in a world of objects is in place, there's no seeing. That's just looking. Yeah? And every looking, in a way, is a form of blindness to the natural seeing. So there's the hummingbird. We were open it, and it was a big, wide, you know, whatever, swing door that opens and closes. It had like, you know, but he was destined to keep going because of his that format. Yeah? He couldn't recognize that. Yes, we're right in the midst of what we're looking for, yet there's no recognition of it because we're trying to recognize it as what we're not. We're trying to recognize subjectivity as a subject. You can't do that. Yeah? It's impossible to recognize subjectivity as a subject. The only way it can occur is you make it an object. Yeah? For you to experience subjectivity as a subject, you have to make subjectivity as an object. Something to be studied and practiced and this and that. That's not it. It's relinquishing the sense of being a subject. Yeah? questioning it maybe, just entertaining it may not be so, and when that drops, everything is clear as day, that hummingbird would have flown right out. You didn't need to build a door, it was there. You didn't need to build an opening, it was there. You didn't need to build wings for it to fly out, it had them. Everything was in place except it was ignorant of one fact. There's the door. What we're ignorant of is we're in a mechanism of mind that's processing life as the subject. And we're missing the subjectivity of it all. We've made the subjectivity subjective. So it has a similar movement. It's like, yeah, I am seeing, I am hearing, I am feeling. That seems true. But the I is a feeling of being a subject. Yeah, I'm seeing. I, a Paul, a separate sense, am seeing. That's what loses it. So it's not about getting a new way of looking, it's just realizing all ways of looking really are forms of blindness. Let all that stuff that seems as real as real can be, let it be as real as real can be, and we'll see what happens. One moment of the absence of self obviously implies there's no needed for your survival. (laughs) Have you ever had moments when you were free? totally absent of self, and yet you seemingly continued, didn't you? Every night you go to sleep, you go to deep sleep, and you seem to continue the next day. It was the absence of self then. There was no awareness of being a body and nothing at night. Yeah, you were in deep sleep, bye-bye. Yet you wake up, and nothing is ended seemingly. It's an afterthought. It's the mental process is reaction to life. Even the brain that's studying now, the brain doesn't think of you as a body. You know that? The brain doesn't think of you as a body. The brain takes from where your hand goes, let's say, all around you. This is what it calls you. So let's say if you're good at painting and you pick up a brush and you're painting with a brush, I used to do this house painting, you could actually feel the bristles when you were cutting a thin line, yeah? You could feel the paint moving on the thing as if your finger was in the paint. Because the brain, at that point, took the brush to be part of you. Yeah? When you're driving a car, the car is taken to be part of you by the brain. 
but there's a very stubborn little mental process going on that takes you to be a body, and alone and only as a body. That mental process is the, is the birthplace and the regurgitation and the reinforcement of the idea of being a self. When that gets severely damaged, that part of the brain that does that, the person has no sense of being a self. Have you ever read those stories about a person? They can't recognize their husband and their kids. They don't have any feeling for them whatsoever. It's as if the whole thing, that whole thing that was contrived and made up got startled and now it has no, no, no relevance whatsoever. And the mind, the brain has to really fire and make a new self. It goes crazy to make sense of this fucking place. So there's no object without a subject, no subject without an object. This whole event called me, seem, z is one unbroken fabric. Yeah? The mind just comes in and inserts nouns everywhere and tells a story. The freedom is when everything is seen as seeing. Everything is alive. Everything is being. There's nothing dead and stagnant that can be autopsied and known. You can't know. This is a living scripture. It's just the way you live. And then you're probably at the highest point when you don't even know it. <laughs> Doing your day. Really. Your whole mind missed when you were actually feeling the best. Yet your whole life premise is to feel good all day. I, that's what I... I think it's a little story is, isn't it? But when you're actually feeling the best, it really unnoticed. It doesn't notice it at all. It wants to just keep going. Yeah? It has a mythical, conceptual idea of what it's going to be. When you get the real thing, it doesn't really give it much evidence, does it? It doesn't really stop. The whole day doesn't stop. You just keep on seeking. <laughs> you know? <laughs> the premise is that you would stop when you found, isn't it? Isn't that the premise? Isn't that the premise? When I sat down to meditate for 13 hours, I didn't want to meditate for 800 hours. I was hoping something was going to happen that would allow me not to have to meditate for 13 hours. I would, something would dawn on me that would say, it's okay, Paul, you don't have to meditate 13 hours more. That was the whole point why I was meditating 13 hours. I wanted to get to a state that I didn't have to meditate for 13 hours again. <laughs> But then you hit that state, and you got to do a turbocharge retreat. You got to keep, 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 keep going and going, and going. It's incessant. You don't get it. It's just the mind seeking. It has no intention of finding. It's not like, oh, I'll really rest when we get to that place. See, when we're really at peace, me and you will kick back and hang out. No, probably not. The mind will be yapping, going crazy. Isn't that true? You're at a place, let's say, in the desert. It's meeting all of your plans. You know, just perfect. Yet the mind wants to think about the next trip. They just want to, let's, uh, let's go. <laughs> but I mean, it was, just, it was just so obvious. The silence down there was so deafening. Yeah, and it was beautiful because Deb was talking about it where there was not too many objects going on, just rocks, and they weren't moving. And it really... Uh, affected her being the subject, yeah? She started losing the sense of being an individual subject and giving into the bigness of the whole event. Yeah, so beautiful. The whole event, that seamless event of rocks and air and no sound and whatever. Seamless, yeah? The, the, the little sense of being in its little perch and then lifting off. Oh, it's so great, yeah? That's available all the time. Not that event, because that's made up. You are that. What was being impressed on you there wasn't it. That's you. That's mine. That painting of that desert was not the desert. That's mine. Yeah? That's all of you expressing its own qualities. That silence and peace is not a foreign object out there that you and I can have an experience of. It's an echo of our own mind. Our own mind is the mother and father of all that. Our own mind, not the constructed mental process part. 
the mind. Yeah? That silence that would bring you to your knees. It was so beautiful because we're in this desert. Incredible silence. Then you hear this trickling of water. And they had this little tiny waterfall from this rain, big rainstorm had. And it was deafening in this little, because there's no other sound. This little, like, someone left a spigot in the bathroom on. But it was, you could hear it from, like, 40 yards away. And then you get there, and it's just this little, like, it was about this high. <laughs> but it was so, it was like being at Niagara Falls. You know, it was so fucking cool. <laughs> is mind, yeah? Everything that's being conceived implies the conceiver. Not you, but what's conceiving, yeah? The dreaming is the dreamer. They're one and the same. The dreaming is the dreamer. There's no separation. There's no dreaming and dreamer. The dreaming is the dreamer. And the dreamer is the dreaming. Yeah? There's no place to separate. Mind can't handle that. It has to put a line in, put a noun in, write a story about it. Yeah? The verbs get shorter and shorter, and you're like, don't think more now. Every freaking... <laughs> it's like, maybe when you were young, you had a little large verb. And then a little bit, and then a noun would come in here and there. Oh, Paul, you're such a nice kid. And oh, your mother would insert a noun. And you go, okay. But the day was a lot of verbing, yeah? And as you got all, as long and long, it was just nouning all day. You know, you'd walk into a room and think about it. What did people think of me? What did anyone see me? Of my zipper down? It's just constantly nouning. That's what I call the overriding verb of selfing. Yeah? It's like, when I say identification as self, that's not, an, it's a verb. That's what mind's doing. The verb is identifying as a self. That's called selfing. That's why selfing is the act in all of its myriad forms of identifying as self. That's all it is. So, it's, it's gotten, a, it's verbing like crazy, a noun. <laughs> a feeling of a noun. <laughs> That's why you're so obsessed with self. To be obsessed with a noun, there has to be a lot of verbing. <laughs> to construct a feeling of a noun, it's like, you know, those helicopters. If a helicopter's going like this and goes really fast, it looks like it's one piece, yeah? You don't see it. That's what it's a Selfing is like whoosh, whipping up so fast, you get a feeling of being, yeah, a noun. It's a lot of work, eh? You get exhausted. It, any, it, there is not a noun here. So any implying of noun had to be produced by a verb. That's selfing. Everything is verbing. There's no noun. So what's producing the sense of a noun is a verb. And we're, I think, we're totally obsessed and our interest and attention is in the verb of selfing. Yeah? We're addicted to it. Not we. There's an addiction to it. So, you see an addiction to it. How do you interpret it? We're addicted. Yeah? Everything here with this language is, is a noun. A verb, you see the verb, but it's, in, it's turned right into a noun all the time. So, you see the addiction to selfing, but then I'm addicted. You don't realize that's the product of the addiction to selfing, is the statement, I'm addicted. You don't see it. Yeah? We're suffering, and we don't even see the constant application of the disease. You don't see it. Like this one guy, I remember a teacher, four pages in this translation, transcribed book, of talking about non, of non doership Beautiful. He put it very well. I don't remember it now, but it was very well. And then after four pages, it stopped, and then it was, all right, student, someone asked him a question, and said, okay, I understand what you said, now what do I do? It's just unbelievable. It's just the whole point is there is no doer. That there was a talk. There was a getting of it, but it immediately got turned into the noun again. All right, what do I do? <laughs> it's frustrating if you see it, yeah? because it's so quick. It immediately, it just, a, the biggest epiphany is like a little hiccup to it. It just immediately re, regathers itself, the verbing, and, and then there's a claiming of it. 
You know? It's, it claims its own absence. That's what blows my mind. All the, the best times you've ever felt was when you were, that self was truly, apparently absent. It's always absent, but I mean apparently absent. And yet it still claims its own absence as something it had. It's incredible. It really is. It's a really, it's like a very vigorous verb. Very, very strong mental verb, something. Very, it's like tenacious. Uh, parasitical, I like to say it. Yeah. Not benevolent. <laughs> Not benevolent. <laughs> so we're starting a new year. What's the cult to do? What's the cult going to do? The relying on to being what's happening here has no application to it. Yes? You cannot apply the system of doing and having to quote unquote spirituality. Obviously, look it around. It doesn't work. You may improve the idea of self because anybody that sat for 13 hours and didn't run around like crazy, would probably feel different. Yes? Any mind that stops eating sugar is going to feel different. The apparatus, the phenomena, is going to feel better. That's great. But really, call it what it is. It's not a spiritual condition. It's a physical condition that's gotten better. Nothing wrong with that. But the spiritual condition isn't something that can be produced. How could it be? Even in science, they say energy can't be created nor destroyed, so you can't actually produce it because it's never been unproduced. It's always so. So all you can do is acknowledge whatever. And for me, I like acknowledging what I'm not because that's very clear. Because that I can see and feel and taste. And yes, I can. I can get this that I'm not, but I can't know what I am. But I found I know what I am by realizing what I'm not. That's the act of knowing what I am. It's the, the awareness of what I'm not is the, how I'm living what I am. Yeah? I don't know if that, you get it? I get it. <laughs> it's working. So, that's just the way I handle it. I just look at it that way. That's why I think we can get together like this and describe what we're not very clearly. And then once there's a recognition of it, what's recognizing it is what you are. Because obviously, what recognizing it is not part and parcel of it. Yeah? Because part and parcel of it cannot recognize it. Yes? It only recognizes from it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Jack? What would, Paul, what would, your, what would be your back door solution be to a long term smoker having a desire not to smoke? I don't know. I don't have an experience that I never smoke, but I would. Uh, just not smoke. <laughs> really? I mean, you can look at who wants to smoke and see if it's you. See, if you see, see these impulses that have such a strength happening, they're really turbocharged when you believe it's you. Yeah? I've noticed that if, if, just like when a thought is seen as a thought, it's a lot different than when it's seen as my thought. When it's seen as my thought, it has a lot more weight to it. Yeah. So my discovery was that if it's not about you, you'll lose interest in it. And so the whole scale of weight distribution will shift dramatically if, you, if it's not about you. So this, uh, this, the idea of smoking is more about you smoking than smoking. Yeah? So if I'm not that you, maybe you'll be able to travel later through it. That's what I find. Yeah. second, Jim, though. The thought is, the seeing of a thought is a sense also. You see a thought like the eye sees a bird. So you are, yes? The seeing of a thought is like a sense. Yeah, it's like a sense. 
It's another form of seeing. In Buddhism, you know, in Western, Western ways, they call us having five senses. In Buddhism, they think the mind is a sixth sense. So uh, a thought is like a mental object yeah. to the mind, just like a bird would be a, an object to the eye. Yeah. So it's just another sense. So you, the same thing applies. It's a, it's a form of being conscious contact. It's seeing thoughts. Yeah, that's conscious contact. It's when you get engaged with the thoughts. See, that's what I'm talking about with the mind. As soon as the thought is sensed as my thought, that's the mental process kicking in. Yeah? The contact of seeing the thought has now been claimed as, oh, what I saw is my thought, and therefore I'm the thinker of it. Yeah? Just like I talked about, you missed the beginning of the, of the, the subject objectiveness of it. Yeah? Suddenly the thought is an object to subjectivity. If it becomes my thought, it's now an object to your subjectiveness, which is different, yes? A thought is seen by subjectivity, yes? Thought, 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 thought. When it's held as my thought, that subjectivity has been claimed. You now are having a subjective experience with that thought, and it's my thought, yes? That's the total shift from one ball game to the other ball game. The first ball game is the conscious contact, seeing thoughts, yes? The second ball game is the claiming by the mental process of being the thinker of the thought or that they're about me as an object, yeah? You see what I mean? Then, as soon as the thought becomes my thought, I become unconscious to the conscious contact of the thought. I have, I've now, it's shifted into, oh, this is my thought and I'm the thinker of it or it's about me. Then you're in that road again. Yes, the mind is now in its little realm. Yeah? But it's applied to every sense. Same way. Same way. Seeing, I'm the seer of that thing. Yeah? Seeing is, yes, I'm the seer of that thing. That's the interpretation. There's nothing wrong or right with the interpretation. That's what mind does. But if your interest and attention is absorbed in that, and you're identified as that, you take yourself to be what that implies, the my, as this, then there may be a little bit of... Um, you may be participating in exquisite mental suffering quickly. Yes? Of course, it's, there's no you participating. You can't speak about, you can't really cast what's happening, but let's just say that mental suffering may be the dominant mental state now. Yeah? Because you'll be living in what's not happening, and the mind will just be going off, thinking about all these things that could possibly happen to you. Yeah? Yes? All triggered by the my. Always, always. It happens. I watch it. It happens, 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 happens. That's why we're attempting to see. It's a, you're seeing a thought just like you see a bird. And just like the bird flies by the window, the thought will fly by. Its nature is to come and go. Yeah? It's like an asteroid comes into your orbit, but see, once it becomes mine, you make it a moon. And now it's reflecting the light of awareness onto self all day. Just like the moon reflects light, yes? The moon has no light of itself. It sucks the light of the moon, sun, and then it reflects, and we can see the moonlight, yes? But it's not the moonlight, no, it's the sunlight, yeah? So there's mine, and these asteroids come in thoughts, and there's a clear reflection of the awareness and the thought appearing in it. And then, yes, the claiming, the mental process claims that, it reflects that, and it bounces that light off to a self. So now the idea of being a self becomes the moon, actually the earth, or actually the sun. You forget about the sun now because you become the sun, and now everything is you, yes? So it's hard to recognize the sun when you're playing a role as the sun. Because yeah? you recognize the sun as you. <laughs> and that's why you're not getting a good spiritual tan. <laughs> even, though you, even, though, even though you're the sun. <laughs> you have a good one. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's true. <laughs> it's sort of like that. Like here, you're here. Clouds seem to block you from the sun. But if you were here, you'd see the clouds, but they would have no ability to block you from the sun. It's the same thing. It's just 
the claim. Check it out. And like Z tries to say a lot, which is good, is there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the implication that there's a someone that could cause it to distort this place. So then you see everything in a very overly subjective way. Yes? That's why there's very little understanding. How can I understand you or how you are seeing things if it's so down that little rabbit hole? So people have that feeling that they're not understood, that they're eternally unique, that no one can help them because they're locked in this very isolated little subjective point of view. Yeah? There's subjectivity, there's not a subject. Subject would imply a one, yeah? I don't think that's so. There's no one. I like zero. I like none without a first. It's just, all I can sense is onness. That's it. I don't know where. There's anyone that started it, who knows? (laughs) It just seems to be blatantly on, constantly, (laughs) with no interruption whatsoever. It's just first-hand information, in a sense. There's not much to need to know after a while. It's just it's self-evident that there's no way you can know fucking anything, though. Really. It's such a great relief. Yeah. I, the only knowledge I believe is knowing what you're not. I believe that can be helpful. It, it can be pointed out to you and expressed in a certain way that it triggers something. Then it can be helpful for the mind will come out of that asana or posture it's been in, or selfing. And then the feeling and everything about the dream will reverberate that because it's the dreamer. It's dreaming. How could it not reverberate? If the dreamer and the dream are the same, which is dreaming, then when there's something shifts, then it reverberates in the dreaming. Maybe you'll call it coincidences. Maybe you'll feel grace. Maybe gratitude will infuse you into your attitude. Who knows? But there'll be indications or expressions of that, you know, that tremor through the whole dream scheme because it's, you're the, you're the center of everywhere. So what here is everywhere. The everywhere that you feel you're in is here. And when this, when a little pebble drops in here, it affects everywhere in this. It's dreaming. It's a stream of dreaming. Yeah. And then you find out, you know, and it's really not even a need to know, but you do, the mind finally gets it after maybe a year, or a couple of years, or months, or day. It starts sensing, shit, something's happened here. It's not like it was. Yeah? It's sort of like, no one's t- taking it off the throne. They just The throne just keeps getting cut. It still thinks it's on the throne, but it's getting dropped. Yeah? <laughs> and by the time it's, it's just, there's no more legs, so there's no more throne. You know? Like, what? But it's, you know what I mean? It's not like a big, I gotta kill it and throw it off the throne. No, it's just a... The termites of unspoken yesness just eat away, and the throne keeps getting tiny, and then it's just normal and average, and everything's cool. That's good to hear. That's good to hear because uh, I know people have a tendency, I certainly do, to expect for a big moment when it's all going to be taken care of. When in fact there are lots of small moments when I see how it is, and then I forget it. I get back into believing who I, you know, that I am, and so, and you know, all of that. And then there is another moment where I sort of see how it is quickly to be forgotten and you know, replaced by the total identification. And uh, it's good to hear that it's sort of a gradual, I mean, not gra- whatever it is, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to happen to everybody in this bang. No, no, no. no. The big bang will be when you leave here. Right, right. I think when you leave here, without you here, there ain't no here. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it all rolls up like a carpet, and that's it. <laughs> and I don't think there'll be a you that has any memory of being here, or not, because there's only a you here. <laughs> there's only a you to have memory here. <laughs> I, 
could be wrong, but I don't believe so. <laughs> it doesn't matter. My sense of when I've died and come back, it was there was no, there was no sense. Oh, I was once there. There was no here. It was like bye bye. I mean, I was something that I am was still here when this stopped, and then when this rebooted back, that something that was always there was still here. Yeah, and yet there's no knowledge that trans that that moves from one to the other, in a sense. It's just, there's a very clear like delineation in a way. There's no. You think that stuff's leaking in, but those are just a, those are intimations of it. But I, I believe it's a totally different non-realm. Yes, in a way. That there's no. How can you miss something when you leave it? If you really leave the system, there'll be no missing of it. The only thing that can miss this system is what's in the system. And it's not leaving the system. <laughs> so in a way, <laughs> there's no one ever going to miss it. I think that's cool to me. <laughs> I like that. That's very free. So you can get, you know, if you feel like you have it, free will exert it. Get into your day. Yeah, if you feel like you want to grab the bull by the horns, do it. Fucking go for it. There's, there's no you. There's no you not to, oh, I, there is no you to d- do that. Yeah, there was no you when you did it. Yeah? In other words, there's never been a you, so you don't have to start act like a non-you. <laughs> I'm a non-you now. Can't be doing anything. No, if something seems the wrong. Fucking change it, or not. Yeah. It's clean. It's not like a story about it. You just go ahead and do it. Like. That's it. Eh? Today. More questions. I'm happy to see everybody.